Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Atlantic Sill podcast. Today, we're going to be talking to Javier Robles about the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a big topic, probably the biggest topic in decades, maybe centuries for people with disabilities. Uh, we're just going to learn more about Javier's work and his background. So I'm going to give it to Javier to, to kick us off. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing at Rutgers and how you got there. Sure. How are you, Donald? It's great seeing I'm you. I'm good. Yeah, so my name is Javier Robles. I am a professor at Rutgers. I'm also the director for the Center for Disability Sports, um, Health, and Wellness in our department. Um, in terms of how I got to Rutgers, I guess that's sort of a weird and detoured sort of route. I actually graduated from Rutgers as an undergrad and went to work for a few different disability nonprofits, including an independent living center, as well as, you know, a, a place that works for with individuals with intellectual disabilities. And then I also went back to work for Rutgers for a little while and eventually decided that I just wanted, you know, more in terms of education. So I applied to law school and was accepted in a few law schools, including Rutgers, but Seton Hall as well. And like many people with disabilities, you know, my decision really wasn't based around the school I wanted wanted to go to is really based on logistics of getting to where I needed to be, which is Seton Hall, which is a more expensive school for sure, but also only two blocks from the train station, you know, which I'm sure many of your um, listeners can relate to in terms yes. of our yeah. overall situations, which, you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about, you know, as we Yeah, go yeah. And then it's, I always call it, sometimes it gets referred to as like the disability tax kind of. <laughs> like, like yeah, it's Yep. Yeah, you know, I, I refer to it as the disability penalty. You know, and I've been thinking about writing an article basically calling it a penalty because people with disabilities get penalized for being disabled every single day or every single hour just because we have to make decisions that we don't want to make only so that we can either survive, live independently, or have, you know, more options available to us, you know, similar to you know, I would have loved to have gone to Rutgers Law School because it was half the price. I love going to Seton Hall, you know, don't get me wrong, it was a great law school and I had great supports there. But, you know, the fact that my decision was based on, well, I have to hop on a New Jersey Transit train in New Brunswick, end up in Newark, and in the middle of winter in my power wheelchair, I'm not going to be... Uh, you know, taking the risk of getting stuck somewhere, so. Yeah, and I, just like you, I went to law school. I went to Delaware Law School. Uh, now it's Delaware Law School. It used to be Wyden University School of Law, but just like you, I had to, you know, you have to factor in, okay, is this the, not only is this the school I want to go to, but is it, how accessible is it? How are they giving accommodations? And also, um, I always think about, and I like your word penalty instead of tax, because tax kind of implies that you're at least getting something in return. Exactly, like you're, right. you're paying into something and you're getting some back, whereas penalty, you're not you're not getting some something back. I, I was thinking too of the LSATs. And for, for those of you who aren't familiar, the LSATs are like the, the law school entrance exams. They're like the SATs for law school. And like just that that whole test is not very disability friendly. You know, the, there's a lot of the logical games uh, section killed me mm -hmm. because there was a lot of real intense. And for those of you that don't know this kind of in the weeds, but there was a lot of real intense writing. And uh, I don't write. So I had to, you know, translate to my my scribe who I just met that day, logical games. And I would always wonder what my score would have been if I uh, if there was a test that was more accessible. But these are the things people with disabilities have to deal with all the time. And that brings me kind of the, to the pandemic is people without disabilities have their challenges, mm -hmm. but it's exacerbated for people with disabilities. So Talk about the Disability Action Committee, Javier, and how you came up with that and how you formed that, because it's been a real effective committee, probably one of the most effective committees I've ever sat on. So just tell well, us about that. Sure. You know, you probably know this, Donald, like, I really don't take any credit for other people's work. And this is, you know, it might have been something that I pushed for initially, but it's not something that would have been as successful or would have gotten as much done if we wouldn't have had the right people in the room. But yeah, initially I reached out to some people at the governor's office, especially during the early days of COVID when we saw 
some of the horrors that were happening, you know, in nursing homes to people with disabilities, that we saw some of the things that were happening to the elderly, and also some of the things that were happening in group homes, as well as some of the stories that I'm sure you and many people heard or read about, you know, where people with disabilities were literally being turned away from hospital because you know, there wasn't enough ventilators or because there wasn't enough room. You know, these horror stories that, you know, in today's day and age, we thought we were past, but obviously that was the jolt and a wake up call for a lot of people, hopefully a lot of young people with disabilities who see that we are still to some extent, not too far from our historical roots, which were, you know, rooted in eugenics and discrimination and those type of issues. So when I reached out to the governor's people, they were obviously busy, you know, there was a lot going on. There there was constant meetings. So I was told, well, you know, there's nothing that we're doing at the governor's level to set up any type of committee to work on these issues. And, you know, she made a suggestion. She was like, well, why don't you, you know, start working on something? I was like, okay, you know, if you guys aren't doing anything, then maybe I'll, I'll reach out. So, you know, I reached out to um, a bunch of uh, different um, people, including the ombudsman's office. And, you know, I reached out to NJDDC, the New Jersey Development of Disabilities Council. I reached out to People I know, but I also took suggestions of people that should be on the committee. Paul um, recommended some people from the ombudsman's office. Other people recommended other people because, you know, at that point, it's like whoever wants to be on this committee that thinks this is important work at this point, you know, feel free to join us. We didn't really have any restrictions into who could join the group. I mean, we were fortunate that we really got a lot of people who at that point weren't just interested in doing something about what was happening in terms of COVID and people with disabilities, but were sincerely worried for the health and safety of themselves. And, you know, in some cases, the parents, the people they love or your siblings, you know, we, we all got together and we basically decided on a few rules. But one of the rules really was, you know, if we're going to concentrate on issues of COVID, you know, let's think more generally in terms of what affects all of us as people with disabilities and not specifically like we like to do, which, you know, I think is not often helpful in our own siloed approach, right? I'm a person who's blind. This is my yes. issue. I'm a person who has a spinal cord. This is my issue. You know, when it came to COVID, I think we can all agree that this was all our issues. And COVID and the way people with disabilities were getting treated really became an issue that affected you, me, a parent, a child with a disability. And, you know, we all agreed on that because it's easy to divide our community. You know, it's easy to pit one of us against each other. It's easy to say to a few different groups, even in independent living, hey, here's $100,000 which one of you wants it, right? And then you start this little mini war of we're going to get this money, it's going to be us, it's going to be you. But we missed the big picture, which is $100,000, $100, well, you know, maybe to the average person, it's a lot of money. It's not a lot of money when you compare some of the issues we've seen in COVID. So we were able to get organized. We were able to really begin looking at the issues of what was happening to people on the ground. Our members split up into committees and basically looked at a bunch of different issues, whether it was, you know, people not getting access to hospitals, people not being able to visit. One of the independent living centers here in Edison, the Access Center for Independent Living, you know, looked at issues of how people were not getting access to food because the food cards that they would get from the Department of Human Services basically wouldn't be something that they could use online. And as you know, initially in the early stages of this, the only way to get food was online because we didn't have assistance coming to our house. We didn't have people going out and shopping. So, you know, there, there were a lot of issues that we worked on. We actually, you know, as you know, we developed this report and we were pretty critical of, of the systems. We were critical of state services, not because we were just complaining, but because the reality is that these are real issues. This is what was happening. And we sort of made a point of pointing that out. And, you know, we were honest with ourselves and we were honest with the lawmakers we met, with the governor, whoever it was, telling them these are the problems. Now, we've identified a lot of the problems. There's a lot more, but we want to know how you're going to fix these problems. What are you going to do about them? You know? Yeah. And I just, I thought it was really effective and we'll link to the report in the bio for this podcast um so you guys can find it and see where we started and now we're really working on just other policy issues because you know i think i always get frustrated when people go what are disability issues and the answer is everything is a disability issue the answer yeah. is I mean, housing healthcare, you know guns police brutality anything you can think of disproportionately affects people with disabilities and then disproportionately affects minority and historically underserved groups even worse if you have a disability mm -hmm. 
So it's really not, you know, that's why what you're saying is so important about getting out of the silo and approach or getting out of just focusing on a few issues. And the other thing I always tell people is that disability issues will become your issues eventually. If you live long enough, somebody you love will live long enough. So all the stuff that we are asking for has been stuff that even if you can't get on board with the overwhelming moral case for doing the right thing and advancing disability rights, even if you just want to make a self-serving case for disability rights, there is a strong self-serving case for disability rights. You know, I remember I went to my first nickel conference, the National Independent Living Council Conference, and there was a bit, they did the march, they do a march on Washington, D.C., and they were really focused on nursing homes and the conditions of nursing homes. And, you know, I've always been nursing home skeptical, but I was like, well, uh, this is a lot. And this is quote unquote, pretty radical. But then I look back. So I look back, that was two years before the pandemic. And I look back now and I go, well, those people were right on the money, actually, (laughs) actually, because we've seen a lot of, I remember one statistic, 30% of the COVID deaths came from nursing homes. And that was the, the, the beginning of the pandemic. And now, you know, So just kind of talk about really where we are on the pandemic now for people with disabilities. Are things getting better? Are people listening to us? Where where are we with everything? Well, that's a good question. Sometimes it's easy during the heat of the pandemic to be all in on what you're going to do you know, about fixing some of the issues that we've identified. And these issues are, of course, broader. And when you said that, you know, we've, we've to some extent gone beyond some of the issues. Yes, we've gone beyond some of the issues that we initially identified as problem issues. Some of those issues have been solved either through the departments or, you know, legally or some other way. But some of those issues are still with us. You know, nursing homes is a huge issue for people with disabilities. Right in New Jersey right now, we're having an issue with Disability Rights New Jersey, who's trying to access, you know, one of these nursing homes and basically has had a heck of a time just trying to get in there, even though they're the federally mandated agency that's supposed to go into these nursing homes and make sure that people are safe. That same nursing home, you know, and the owners of that same nursing home who who've since changed their name, are the same people where we saw, you know, during the height of COVID, having staff members and people with disabilities and the elderly being pulled out of body bags from that place. Because even before the pandemic, they were receiving, you know, F ratings and D ratings and, you know, low scores by the state of New Jersey and the federal government. So there are still so many issues in terms of not just enforcement, but also accountability. As a person with a disability and a taxpayer of this state, I want to see these these places being held accountable. People don't just die without something happening to them. And nursing homes nationally still continue to be one of the biggest places where people with disabilities are dying from COVID. So it's not something that's gone away. We as people with disabilities need to do more in terms of holding government accountable, in terms of holding these these companies accountable, because after what we've seen, we, we can't be comfortable just sitting back and saying, well, I'm a person with a disability, you know, I really can't do anything about that. You know, we, we, we have to take almost the opposite approach, which is I'm a person with a disability and my voice matters. And the more voices that are out there like mine, the more I'm going to make a difference. Yeah. And I would just say, because I totally agree with that, that I think it's the job, especially of us people with disabilities who do not live in nursing homes to really advocate for those who don't, because as somebody, you know, I've worked with some people in nursing homes, it's really, they get really, not only, they get ignored. It's easy to ignore them because they usually end up there because their family can't take care of them for whatever reason or another. It's very complicated and it's easy for a nursing home to, you know, nobody's there 24 seven, except for the people who have a vested interest in saying they're doing a great job. So, So it is, it is very hard to get to the truth of the matter sometimes. And it's up to, I think, people on the outside to really advocate for those people who are easy to forget about, easy to say, you know, and easy to not think about. But we've learned that those are the people who are most vulnerable to things like the pandemic. And it's one of the things that people uh, on the disability rights movement have been advocating for a long time is more community options for 
mm-hmm. people with disabilities um, so they can live in the community. I have, I still, I'm working with somebody in a nursing home now who would love to be on the community. And of course, the nursing home says it's not safe. Of course, we've heard that over and over again. And, and I always get a little worried when I hear about quote unquote safety. I think sometimes that's used as a cudgel to keep people with disabilities in a place they don't want to be. So, you know, we just want more options for people and more opportunities for people to live in the community. Medicaid is paying for these nursing homes. Like you said, they're all taxpayer funded. So we have a stake in them. (laughs) Um, Yeah. yeah. So we really have to ask those tough questions. Not to say that every nursing home is doing a bad job. But no, should, I mean, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying that, and, and, and I don't think that every nursing home is doing a b- bad job, but I think when we find bad apples where people are dying, where people with disabilities, the elderly, where veterans who serve this country are dying, that that should be a serious issue that we take seriously as, as you know, New Jersey citizens, whether you have a disability or not, and say what we're looking at and what we're seeing is not right. This is not America. This is not a constitutional place where we're okay with this. You know, making money is one thing, but failing at what you do with the results being people with disabilities dying or being sent to a hospital, you know, that's not equitable treatment of people with disabilities. Right, like that's not said, it. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. And, and I was going to say, like you said before, a lot of these people are people of color. A lot of these people are poor people. They don't get sent to the best nursing homes. We know there's great nursing homes in the state of New Jersey. You know, I can name off like five right off the bat. When you send people to some of the worst nursing homes because it's cheaper or because of whatever reason it is, that's not equitable to people with disabilities. It's not equitable to the elderly. It's not equitable to these people who have served this country in, uh, you know, in a capacity in the armed forces. I mean, you know, we think of people with disabilities as this monolith, you know, they're just people in wheelchairs and that's probably the first <laughs> thing that comes to our mind. Yes. And that's, you know, the the furthest from the truth. They're, they're you know, they're veterans. They're people who've worked hard, they're, you know, your next door neighbor. And, you know, maybe when we start to think of people that way, we'll care a little more about what happens to them in these places. Yes. And they could be you. Like that's what you could Mm -hmm. end up in one of these places. And absolutely. And it's, it's a very, and then you're, you know, a third, like I said, whenever that statistic just stuck with me, 30% of the COVID deaths, like that's an unacceptable number for any place. So, you know, I just think it's a really important thing that we look at and we really think about reforms and better systems to hold these nursing homes accountable. And like I always say, whenever, you know, cause people are, some people go, well, don't beat, beat up on all blank, 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 all nursing homes. Well, I'm like, well, good nursing homes will welcome accountability. They will welcome accountability and they will say, Great. We think it's great. It's the ones who don't want accountability that I always get. I always think they reveal themselves. <laughs> so, good so nursing well. moms don't have anything to worry about. I mean, they're yeah. doing, you know, a good job. But, you know, like you said, everyone else that that that's worrisome. And, and you know, the, the other thing, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, just getting back to one of your questions that we, we, we still want to see is, you know, we've asked the state of New Jersey and we've asked lawmakers. Um, initially, there was a bill that went through last year talking about making New Jersey, um, you know, Office of Emergency Management a better place for people with disabilities by um, bringing in experts to work on these issues of pandemics and natural disasters and weather disasters or man-made disasters. And we were talking about, you know, having this office funded better by giving them a million dollars and providing up to four positions that would serve the state of New Jersey within um, the office. And, you know, still to date, we haven't seen any action on this, which is troubling, right? you know, we're still dealing with variants of COVID every single day or every single week. And we don't think it's important enough to look at this issue in a in a more systemic way. And, you know, a million dollars to the state is not a lot of money, literally a drop in the bucket when you think about the overall state budget. So, you know, and also when you weigh it against the cost of not doing anything, which is always <laughs> yes. a big cost. Yeah. So, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad you're talking about the variants and kind of more about the virus now. So I understand what you're saying, Javi. So you're saying putting our head in the sand and saying we're tired of the virus is not a, it's not a good strategy on going forward. I think that's what you're, maybe, we're, maybe it is for maybe it is for other communities. <laughs> 
maybe it is for, you know, people who are in certain political parties, but I can tell you for a fact that it is not something that people with disabilities can afford to do. We can't afford to say we're tired of the variant. We can't afford to say we're tired of fighting. And we can't afford to say, you know, we're in a better place than we were two years ago when this thing started. When you look at um, just this morning, a report saying that, you know, we're going to hit the one million dollar, the one million person dead mark for people with COVID in, this, in the United States. I mean, one million people probably would have died by the time this podcast is out. Think about yes. that. Are we really done with COVID when people are still dying every single day and when the numbers keep rising? Right, I agree. I think um, I remember when COVID first happened and COVID was first starting and people saying, well, 100,000 deaths would be a lot. And now we're up to a million. It's like it's yep. totally has we're kind of numb to it now, which is unfortunate. And uh, I, well, under, I, I you know, go ahead. We, 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 we can't afford to be numb. I mean, like I said, you know, maybe other communities can, but we cannot afford to just sit back and say, well, you know, things are going to get better if right. we don't act on on what we're seeing. You know, you, you said it earlier, you know, we we to some extent are our brothers and sisters keepers, you know, and if I don't speak up for other people with disabilities, regardless of their disability, regardless of whether they have an intellectual or developmental or a physical or, you know, a sensory disability, then I'm just as much to blame as anyone else is. If I have the power to speak and I I just sit back and say, well, you know, that's their problem. Right. No, that's your problem. You know, disabilities is a general problem. And it's so long as we continue to allow government and corporations and other people to say, well, you know, you guys fight amongst yourself and figure it out. We're not going to get anywhere. You know, we're going to get somewhere when we say, let's all get together, similar to the way we did with the ADA, similar to the way that, you know, Judy Human and a bunch of other people did with 504 and didn't look at who had an intellectual disability, didn't look at who was blind and said, this is all our problem and let's get stuff done because we're not going to get stuff done any other way at this point. You know, the more we continue to fight about, I don't want to say little things, but things that in the broader perspective of what we've seen the last two years, you know, we should really take note of what's important to us, you know, education across the board for people with disabilities, employment across the board for people with disabilities, emergency management is an issue, right? All these things are large issues that affect all of us that are not disability specific. I agree. I agree. And when I when I said we, I meant kind of society at large, which I think is unfortunate. I think the disability community is still ringing the alarm bells and still saying, you know, this is something we got to address. Not that, you know, society with the vaccine, you know, it's not 2020 anymore. We have mm-hmm. the vaccine, we have some new treatments, but it's still, people are still dying every day, hundreds and hundreds of people, which amounts to, you know, like you said, a million deaths overall, which is amazing and staggering when we think about it, all the human deaths. And disproportionately, people with disabilities or people with pre-existing conditions, which is a mm-hmm. fancy way of saying people with disabilities. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just think that, unfortunately, um, people have kind of, some people have kind of just wanted to move on for the sake of moving on, but... So what, what, what do you think the disability community should be focused on now at this point in the pandemic? Mm-hmm. As we see mass mandates going away, as we see kind of like we're, I feel like we're entering a, a different phase, but still a, a dangerous phase because we still have new variants out there and people are still dying. So what would be your recommendation of where we should focus our energy? Um, that's a good question because there's so much going on, right? There, there's masks, there's vaccinations, there's the risk of exposure to people with certain disabilities who are more likely to, you know, be worse off if they were to get COVID even with vaccinations. So, you know, I think a lot of our efforts still to to some extent really has to focus on pushing government to do the right thing. There's no reason why we can't have more accountability from government. There's no reason why we can't have more accountability, even from our own nonprofits, you know, our our leaderships in our nonprofits. You know, if you are in an organization, you know, that deals with disabilities, whatever the disability is, and you see that your leadership within that nonprofit is really not doing anything about what's obviously happening in, in New Jersey and across the nation, then you should ask, hey, what are we doing about these things? Don't feel that just because you're a member of an organization or that you're in a lower rank of an organization that your voice doesn't matter. You know, everybody's voice matters. And people with disabilities need to realize that they have power. The one thing I would suggest to everybody with a disability is that is if you're not registered to vote and you're not voting, 
that you go out and you register to vote. I know all the independent living centers have a push for um, registering people. You know, I'm not saying register for a particular party. I'm saying register to vote. Have a voice in what happens to you. Whether yeah, that don't give up your don't give up your power. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's easy to say, well, you know, voting doesn't matter. But what we have seen is that voting does matter, that some elections across the nation have literally been won by a few votes. So when you look at those elections and you say voting doesn't matter, you're obviously not really thinking realistically. Voting matters a lot and you have the power to make your voice known. Some elections your guys or lady is not going to get in in some elections they are. And that's just politics. But regardless, you were out there, you were voting. Don't be intimidated. You don't give up your power and you got to play, you know, because if you're not voting, then they don't have to pay attention to you. So make these politicians pay attention to you. And if you give up your power and say, you know, I get it. I understand politics. You can be very cynical about it for good reason. Oh, they're all corrupt. Oh, it's all nonsense. And well, the only way to change it and to make positive things happen, and I will say positive things do happen, positive things, we do win sometimes, and we win by getting involved, not by throwing our hands up and saying, there's nothing that can be done, you know, and yeah. corrupt. So, so come join the fight. And like Javi said, it could be, it doesn't have to be, you know, running for, you know, governor or anything, it could be getting involved in your local nonprofit and asking these questions. It's also you know, say, can I get involved? Can I be on your board? This is what I can offer. Because I, as somebody who runs a nonprofit, we're always looking for resources and for help to do more stuff. So, you and, know, there are organizations out there. Don't be afraid to reach out. Yeah. And and, and I was going to say, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about and, and really trying to figure out is we should, as a community, generally push more people with this voice to get involved in politics, to run for office, to run for school boards, to run for, you know, council, to run for Senate and assembly seats. We don't have, you know, that kind of presence. We do have a disability caucus, which um, Mercedes Witowski is has done an amazing job with. But, you know, look around our state. How many people can you identify? Identify, assuming they don't have a hidden disability, can you identify and say, hey, this lawmaker or this council person or this person has a disability? Not many. So we right. should be encouraging and getting people, you know, especially young people with disabilities to run for office because if we're not at the table, our voice is not heard. You know, one, one of the things that the report that we did called for is we want more representations on state boards, on state commissions, because we need to be at the table. Parents with disabilities need to be at the table. People with disabilities need to be at the table because when people who don't understand our issues are coming up with policy, with laws, with different ways to handle things, we're not there to either protest those things that we don't agree with or push the things that we do agree with. So we're left out all over the place, just systemically left out of decisions that affect you and me and the people that are listening to this. So we need to say to government, enough is enough. You know, we need to be there. Right. And also, and that hurts people without disabilities, too, because when the state or when government is not incorporating people with all disabilities, all type of experience in their policymaking, in their emergency response process, they have gaps just because they don't, people don't have those experiences. You know, you talked about Alliance, what they were doing with the food issues online. People with disabilities, if they were at the table, they would have pointed that out very quickly. Nursing homes, like I said, I was at a, a rally two years ago with people worried about nursing homes. There were people with disabilities talking about this stuff. You know, it wasn't a new issue. It was new to people who had blind spots. Mm -hmm. about it. Working from home <laughs> and employment options. People with disabilities have been asking for that for, you know, <laughs> since the beginning of time. Yeah. So, like, and it was so radical right until people without disabilities needed to do it. Then it became, well, what do you expect? So, yeah. but if we were incorporated more from the beginning, we would have been able to have a more effective COVID response. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we, I think, society falls short by not using all of its members it's not living up to its full potential yeah some some other issues that we should be looking at i know we've talked about in in the committee uh, one of them is around access to personal care assistance the direct support 
providers, you know, and people that generally are the people that keep individuals with disabilities in the community. You know, we talk about independent living and staying out of nursing homes, but we need to make sure that programs appropriately and equitably fund people who do these jobs, right? And and one of the um, issues that, that we've been talking about is making sure that people who provide personal care assistance, PCAs, or people that work in the PASP program or other programs are paid appropriately, right? New Jersey is one of the most expensive states to live in, yet we continue to pay people what is relatively barely a living wage. And guess what? We're competing with Amazon, with UPS, with FedEx, all these places that pay way better. So if you're a person who has an option between working with someone with a disability and making sure that they stay in their home, that they go to school, that they are employed, or, you know, going and putting some boxes in another box and delivering them, you know, right. you're going to make that choice. But government really needs to look at these issues of wages. And not to mention the fact that most of the people that work these jobs are women and women of color for the most part. And the other thing is that they're technically poor. A lot of people who work these jobs also still are getting government assistance because they don't make enough money, you know, to meet their daily expenses. So we really have to relook at the way that personal care services are are handled in the state of New Jersey, how much we pay people, and whether we as a state and a nation, because this is a national problem, are really, you know, serious about making sure independent living is an actual thing as opposed to just a myth. Yeah, and it's all connected, right? Because if you don't pay adequate wages, then wages, then there are less personal care attendants for people, and then they have less community options, and then they end up in places like nursing homes. So it's all, exactly. it's all, it's all connected. Homes, yeah, exactly. It's all, it's, it's all connected. All, it's all connected. So I also wanted to talk about kind of the vaccine, because sometimes there's this attitude, like, you know, why should I care if somebody else gets vaccinated or what's the big deal? But I, I'm just touching on personal care attendants. You know, this is why it's important too, because even if, if one of them gets sick, that disproportionately affects people with disabilities who are more vulnerable. So yeah. I just wanted to just speak about, I think it's important, you know, I'm a big individual freedom person. I am at my core, but you do have a communal, you do have a responsibility to your community, like you were saying, mm -hmm. I'm your brother's keeper, to see how to be a responsible person and to do the right thing and get vaccinated if you can, because I just saying it doesn't affect you. You got the vaccine. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's accurate. And I wanted to know yeah. your feelings about that. Sure. Well, first of all, just getting vaccinated doesn't mean that you won't get COVID and that you're protected all the way, right? And right. then if you if you do get COVID after you were vaccinated and you still happen to have a disability or underlying condition that could be detrimental, you could still face hospitalization and other issues. So that that's number one. Number two, just like you, I I, I believe in indi individual freedoms for sure, but. I also deal with people who, you know, just are, you know, anti-vaxxers. There's no way to put it. When you speak to them about these things, they believe that, you know, well, if I take supplements or if I do this or X, Y, Z, I'll be fine with no scientific facts to back those up. I, I am a strong believer in science. I believe that these people have been working on these issues. They're the same people that got us those vaccines that, you know, are now saving lives. So you do have a responsibility to the people you work with. If you're a personal care assistant, if you're, you know, a family member and you come into someone's home who has a disability or underlying condition and you, you're not vaccinated and you know that, and you know that there's a possibility that you could bring COVID to this person, you are gambling to some extent with that person's life. And at the end of the day, the people that are going to suffer are the people who are most vulnerable. You know, if you're a person with a disability and you can get vaccinated, I would highly recommend that you do get vaccinated. You know, when you look at um, vaccinations statistically, they're the best way to keep you alive. Now, this is just my personal opinion. I'm not a doctor, but, you know, Dr. Fauci uh, of the Department of Health has said so, you know, and, you know, you need to take care of yourself. Yes, yeah. And of course, you know, not both of us are in doctors who so speak to your doctor and there are people with uh, immunosuppression who, mm -hmm. you know, why it's so important to get vaccinated because the vaccine isn't as effective for them and it as it will be for everybody else. But I just think it's so important. I mean, even if, if you're just an anti-vax person and you get sick and end up in the hospital, of course, I want you to get care because I, you know, I still 
care about you as a human being if they disagree with your choice. But you're taking away a resource that could be used for somebody with a vulnerable condition. So, you know, this was big, especially during the Omicron wave, these hospitals would get flooded and people would have to put off surgeries that they need to have or, or not get the care that they needed because people made, I think, an irresponsible choice. And just like you wouldn't speed, you know, down a highway, just like you wouldn't get in your car and get drunk and you would you would look down on somebody like that. You should really look at not getting vaccinated if you can the same way. And I, I really believe that, you know, you have a, just like I'm a believer in individual responsibility, I'm all, uh, individual liberty, I'm also a big believer in personal responsibility. <laughs> so I think you need to take responsibility for yourself and the people around you and do the right thing if you're still on the fence about it. And um, I just think it's very, very, a very important thing. And I'm kind of unapologetic about it. So, so direct your hate mail <laughs> this way if you, if you. Uh, oh, and, and, and I was going to say that there are issues, of course, where people with disabilities, it's more difficult for them to get vaccinated. Just someone with an intellectual disability that might be on the spectrum might not like you to poke a needle in their arm. And they, especially if they're an adult and are big, you know, you're going to have to figure out as a system how you handle that issue. I know we've had um, a few people in our committee who had issues like that. So, you know, again, a lot of this stuff goes back to the state thinking these things through. And the best way to do that is to involve people with disabilities from the outset, not after every things done, you know, whether it's vaccinations or anything else, you know, we, we have a lot of issues that that we're still dealing with. And we need people to basically step up and say, okay, what do you need us to do about these things? Because you're the expert. Right. What are our, just admit it. What are our blind spots? What are we not seeing? What are we like, what are we missing? You know, I always think about even as a person with disability, I have a physical disability. So what are my blind spots? What am I not seeing? Cause I'm not deaf. I'm mm. not visually impaired. I'm not on the spectrum. So what am I, you know, people have different experiences. So I always welcome people to tell me, no, Oh, pay attention to this. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, just, so, go ahead. I, I was going to say, it's one of the things that I tell my students, right, in my classes. It's basically, I bring in people with different disabilities to class because as a person with a disability, I can tell you what it's like to have a spinal cord injury. I can tell you what it's like to live with a spinal cord injury and my experiences, but I can't tell you what it's like to be blind. I can't tell you, you know, what it's like to be a person who's deaf. I don't have those lived experiences. So I wouldn't want to speak to someone in, in that capacity. So the same thing, you know, we should expect of government, you know, you should reach out again to these experts in their community, whether they're parents or people with disabilities or whatever, and ask them, you know, what should we be doing? That's a great point. I, you know, I want to uh, just talk about, highlight the importance of also people with disabilities being prepared for emergencies. We had Kelly Boyd on the podcast and mm -hmm. uh, she talked about the importance of emergency preparedness because I want people with disabilities to realize that they can't, I mean, this pandemic should teach you a lot about, you just can't rely on the government to look out for your needs. Unfortunately, we got to fight and make changes, but you got to, you also got to do what you can to be prepared for things like this. So that's why, like you said, voting, registering for things like register ready and just really Really taking an inventory of yourself, thinking of the caretakers you have, the medications you need to survive if something were to happen. Because we've learned that when the disaster does strike, people with disabilities often get left behind. <laughs> so, so I'm just I want to just get your thoughts on that, on the, the importance. I, I know you started a Facebook group. I think it was you who started the people with disabilities helping each other survive COVID. Yeah, which I, uh, I always like the blunt title of it. Like, I'm like, <laughs> I like this. I, I, I think that was the, before you called me, I think I, I saw that group first and right away. I'm like, I like these people. Just, saying. <laughs> Just talk about that, the importance of us as people with disabilities, looking out for ourselves and looking out for our community and coming together like we have. Yeah. Um, during the pandemic. Yeah. Well, I mean, a few things, you know, the first thing is we have seen that we don't really have a choice but to come together. And if we think that we have a choice and that we, if we think that we can independently traverse a society which has historically oppressed people with disabilities, has discriminated against people with disabilities and has looked as, you know, patients in a hospital as opposed to people who should be in a community, then, you know, we are headed down a wrong road because things are not going to get better. However, if we 
do look at each other as not only just support networks, but also team members. Uh, we're on the same team at the end of the day. We may have different disabilities, but guess what? If I'm going to get discriminated against because I walk into a hospital, so are you, right? If I'm going to not get an employment that I applied for because I have a disability and so are you, right? The opinion of these people aren't going to change because the disability changes. We have to work at this at a systemic level. You know, we can't think of this as, hey, if we fix Atlantic City, everything's going to be better, right? Atlantic City is going to be great if you fix Atlantic City in terms of access and everything else, but the rest of New Jersey is still going to be a show. So the reality is we have to fix everything. We have to think systemic. You know, the National Council on Disabilities a little while ago released a report really, which almost mirrored our report to some extent, especially with some of the stuff they were talking about, but also gave a lot of great concrete things we could do. But there's a lot of things we could do, again, as a team that we can't do individually. And we have to really think about how do we hold the people that we put into office accountable. And if we haven't voted or, or haven't registered to vote, we have to do that. And I would encourage everybody to just maybe take a few minutes and think about that million number, right, of people who've died from COVID and think how many of those people were people with disabilities. And the fact that you could have been one of those persons, your child could have been one of those persons. I always think about, I have no idea how I survived COVID or how I didn't to this point end up in a hospital with some of the people I knew and some of the friends I knew did, right? So this is this is everybody's problem. And, and it's not just COVID. You know, this is these are systemic structural issues that have been in place for a long, long time. COVID just happened to shine a light on a lot of these right. issues, right? Right, right. If we address these systemic issues, these issues of access to housing, healthcare, independent living options, all the stuff we talk about, all the stuff we've highlighted and reported, then when a disaster does happen, we'd be in a better position to deal with these things because it just the pandemic shined a light and just exacerbated all those long-standing issues that we have been talking about and putting our head in the sand and saying, oh, it's okay, it's no big deal. Well, in a lot of ways, it resulted in a million people dead. And so that's a huge deal. I always like to end, and we'll wrap up, I always like to end. My favorite question is, if I made you king or emperor for the day, and you could change, three, if you could get three policies passed, it could be national, statewide, what, what, what would be the three? It could be two, if you can't do three but i always like this game because i always like to say kind of what i would do if i had all the power uh relating the disability issues what what are the three big issues if somebody said javi we're giving you the power fix what do you want us to do we'll pass it sure I guess, first of all, um, you know, we would have a real transportation system across the United States that gets anybody with a disability to any place they want, you know, as opposed to these, you know, systems of transportation, which are at best non-functioning for most of us. You know, we don't have rail that's truly accessible. You know, I went to Norway right before COVID and before I got there, I'm sure like many people here, I, I was thinking, well, I'm going to end up getting stuck somewhere. I'm not going to be able to move around this place. And when I got there, I was amazed at how advanced the train systems were, how advanced everything from trolleys to even ferries were in terms of access. Like I literally went 600 miles and I took a speed train, I took a ferry, I took this other train. And I was like, I could never do this in the United States. I could never like say, I want to go 600 miles somewhere and get there within a day. You know, I took Amtrak a week ago from New Jersey to Florida and I was regretting every second of it. They still have the same Amtrak cars that I drove when I was going to law school, you know, in the early, um, uh, well, in the early 90s or whatever. And they're literally the same cars. I know because I caught my arm going out the same car in the same spot that I used to catch my arm every time. I'm like, these are <laughs> cars. nothing has changed. You know, you can remodel them, but you know, horrible. Right. And then you're like rickety. It's like, you feel like you're on one of these, um, stage coaches, you know, with horse-drawn carriages when you're on these things as opposed to that. So I, I think transportation would be a, a huge issue for people with disabilities generally. And I think we really need to do 
a much better job at making sure that people with disabilities have access to personal care services in their community, you know, and that we fund these um, systems better and that people have something they can depend on, right? And I also would like to see within that system the ability for people to work without being penalized. We have great programs in New Jersey, but you're still, you know, if you're paying a cost share, to some, to some extent, you're getting penalized for working still because you're not allowed to make a certain money without paying like 100 100- 100% cost share. So we still keep people with disabilities, even if they work artificially poor, right? Yeah, we're still kind of annoyed at them for working. We're still, <laughs> we're still kind right. of <laughs> we, we're, we're like, hey, we want you to be as independent as possible. We want you to, you know, live the American dream, but just don't live the American dream too much. Because don't you know, don't have it. any don't have any savings. Don't work too much, you know. Don't, so live that dream, but don't get too carried away with it. But so exactly. yeah, that's a big that's a big one for me to get. Yeah, on so I mean, we could see that. Um, and you know, obviously, if we could see some type of policy change around housing, which is one of the biggest issues for people with disabilities, regardless of what state you live in, we could see real progress you know, with these three issues. So housing in New Jersey continues to be an issue. Why people are put into nursing homes, right? If I get injured and I have a spinal cord injury and I end up in Kessler or some other place, if they can't find a place to put me that's safe and accessible, they're going to put me in a nursing home. Right. Right. And And I may stay there for a month or I may stay there for a year or more. And this is where, and we'll close with this, this is where I think people could get involved when they see issues like people wanting to build low-income housing and accessible housing in their neighborhood, like show up to those meetings and speak out in favor of that because a lot of people say they want housing, but just over there, just not in my backyard, don't put it here, put it somewhere, put it somewhere else and you end up with no housing for people. So it's very important that 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 that's hear that. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a good point, right? Because when when we think about low-income housing, we're thinking, oh, that's just for poor people. But remember, when, you know, they put low-income housing in your community, a section of that low-income housing has to be accessible, right? So you're automatically building access into this low-income housing that people could access and not have to end up going into a nursing home or some other place, so... Right, and, uh, you know, I've read, because I get a little obsessed with housing because you know it's a big issue and I was one of those, the solutions and the more housing you have in general the better it is for people because they have more options and lowers the price generates basic economics supply and demand you have more of a supply drives down the cost so I just I think it's really important that people with disabilities sometimes think about that like oh they're building a low-income housing in the neighborhood I don't live in but I'm close to so why does it matter to me no they need to hear your voice there's because I'm telling you NIMBYs they're called not in my backyard yeah, they're very yeah. powerful and they show up to these meetings and then you end up with the situation we're in and um and that's and, when it goes back to hobbies thing you've got we gotta let our voice be heard because and, and they're we letting good, their voice are, be heard yeah and we have good advocates you know norm smith is an amazing advocate on housing and has been working in that field pretty much all his life and you know has been able to build up project freedom uh, you know to a really great model that we could use throughout new jersey but you know i also think that housing should be inclusive no matter what it should just have automatic universal features built into every housing unit. Of of course, now we have a a separate issue, which we didn't have pre-COVID, which is that the rents for all units are extreme that, you know, people can't keep up with the demand for apartments. So where does that leave people with disabilities? Again, in in the cold, because many of us can't afford these rents, even if they were accessible. So, you know, again, there's so many issues, you know, when you, when you mentioned sub issues before that, you know, people can be working on people can, of course, also, if they want to join us or be part of our group, they can, you know, reach out to you, however you, however yes. you want to link that and up. We'll, we'll put content, we'll put contact information in our, in the podcast bio, so you can reach out to these groups. You don't have to save the whole world, but like, like Norm, like Ahabi said, Norm Smith has been working on housing, so that interests you. We just need more voices and more people with stories and telling them. And if you think, oh, I, I have nothing to contribute. I don't know anything about advocacy or whatever. No, you do. If you're living with a disability, you have an experience that is worth talking about and it's worth expressing and that our policymakers need to hear that we can hold them accountable. 
Well, thank you, Javi, for joining us. Me and you could talk forever. We could do like a three-hour podcast. Sure. People would go to sleep with our long list of of complaint. Uh, I'm not even going to say complaint. Ballot issues. But we'll, we'll say advocacy items. Advocacy issues that people with disabilities were right about 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us. And I'm sure I'll have you back again sometime to talk about another issue that'll pop up that I think it's important. But I just think- Sure, my pleasure, anytime. Stay safe, stay safe out there and get involved. Any closing words, Javi? I would say just stay positive. It's, it's difficult sometimes, you know, just stay positive. Things will get better. And, you know, I and know th- it's difficult, but, you know. And things do get better, but they don't get better by themselves. It takes nope. hard work and advocates. And, you know, that's what I'll tell people. Don't get, don't, don't think it'll just change automatically, but don't think it's hopeless either. So thanks yeah. everybody for, for joining us. And I'll see you again on the next episode of the Atlantic Silk Podcast. Bye, hubby. Bye, Donald. Thanks.